Section 26 of Studies in Word Association. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Arden. Studies in Word Association by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by M. D. Eder. Chapter 4. Analysis of the Associations of an Epileptic. Part 1. Chapter 4. Analysis of the Associations of an Epileptic by Dr. C. G. Jung Epilepsy is one of the few mental diseases whose symptomology is thoroughly known and its limits defined by a wealth of cases and of systematic studies. Psychiatry has proved that together with the epileptic fits, mental degeneration is extremely common. Of the latter, it may be asserted that it is specific and therefore of diagnostic value. We will merely mention the chief features of epileptic degeneracy as given in any good textbook. 1. Intellectual Feeble-mindedness Retardation of mental reactions Loquaciousness Limitation and poverty of the imagination with the corresponding poverty and stereotypy of speech Frequently abnormality is a fantasy. 2. Emotional Irritability Waywardness Marked egocentricity Exaggeration of all intellectual feelings, especially of religiosity. These qualities form the so-called epileptic character, which, once set up, must be regarded as a permanent structure. Temporary augmentations of one or other quality, which spring from an intercurrent fit, are probably present. Even without knowledge of the epileptic attacks, the diagnosis can be made with sufficient certainty by the presence of the epileptic character, although cases of this kind seldom arise. When the attacks are rare, it frequently happens that the epileptic character is only slightly developed from a practical point of view. It becomes therefore of some value to find an exact expression of epileptic degeneration. Attempts have been repeatedly made of light to investigate the epileptic aberrations by experimental methods. Colucci, footnote 1, Colucci. L'allenamento ego grafico ne normali e negli epileptici. Bioma medica. Anno 18. Number 36. 1902. End footnote 1. And Brokink. Footnote 2. Brokink. Uber ermudung skurven bakasunden und ba einigen neurosen und psychosen. Journal for Sociology und Neurology, Band 4, 1904. End footnote 2. Have experimented with the ergograph, Sommer. Footnote 3. Sommer. Lehrbuch du Psychopath unter Zuhungsmethoden. End footnote 3. And more especially his pupil, Furman. Footnote 1. Furman. Analyse de Vorstellungs Materials ba Epileptischem Svashsen des Geisen, 1902. End footnote 1. Directed their attention to association in epileptics. We regard these latter investigations as peculiarly adapted for a more exact formulation of epileptic degeneration. Fermon gives an account of the investigation of the associations in two epileptics. The first case was that of a patient who had suffered since the age of 10. The author demonstrated in this case that the predicates were strongly marked and that the egocentric factor played an unusually large part. The reactions in this case could not all be regarded as associations. There were also word reactions whose content and form were in no inner connection with the stimulus word. Fermon calls these reactions unconscious. These reactions were found, according to his tables, at the beginning of the experiment. Series 1 began with the following reactions. 1. Light. Belief. 2. Dark. Health. 3. White. Arm. 4. Black. Blue. 5. Red. Parents. 6. Yellow. Father. 7. Green. Chair. 8. Blue. Arm. Fermon did not attempt any interpretation. Cropoline. Footnote 2. Crapoline, Lehrbuch, 7, Alflage, 1904. End footnote 2. Has accepted this observation in the new edition of his textbook, volume 2, page 626, where he makes the following remarks. It seems as if these images, 
which were liberated, but not produced, by the experiment, proceeded from permanent general tendencies of ideas. Their content was mostly related to the state of the disease, or anyway, to the personal relationships of the patient. We must take it that the frequency of such associations, determined by inner conditions, not by outer excitation, are more peculiarly favored by the sluggishness of the epileptic. It is this which, unlike the healthy person, prevents his finding quick and easy links to the stimulus word. In 1903, I showed in my work Uber Simulation von Geistesterung, Loco Citato, page 181, the disproportionate occurrence of similar meaningless associations in an imbecile during a state of emotional stupidity. Verlin, footnote 3, see chapter 3, and footnote 3, has proved this exhaustively with documentary evidence in his investigations on imbeciles and idiots. In our experience, such meaningless reactions always occur when the subject is in a condition of emotional stupidity. This may, of course, occur in every possible condition of mental aberration. There is, thus, nothing specific of epilepsy in these unconscious reactions. To return to Fermont's work, after about a month, the experiment was repeated with the same stimulus words in the first case. The second case was that of a patient who had been ill since his 17th year. Four repetitions of the reactions were made here within eight months, demonstrating a considerable limitation of the field of association, a marked monotony of the reactions. Upon the basis of the associations of two female idiots, Fermon holds it as a delimitating difference between epilepsy and idiocy that the latter knows no supraordinated concepts. But Verlin has shown that the idiot does recognize supraordinated concepts, although they are extremely primitive. The distinction must therefore really be something much more subtle than Fermon seems to suppose. Reclin, footnote 1. Reclin, Journal für Soziologie und Neurologie, 1904. And footnote 1. In his valuable article on Hebum epileptischer amnesien durch hypnose, occurrence of epileptic amnesia through hypnosis, refers to some association experiments on epileptics. He enters more into the quality of the reactions, and thus reaches various important conclusions. He demonstrated adherence to the content of the reaction, clinging to the same grammatical form, marked relation to the ego, personal constellations, frequent emotional accentuation of the content of the reaction, and poverty of the imagination. These peculiarities are for the most part nothing but reflections of the epileptic character. Reclin has proved the possibility of reading the signs of epileptic degeneration from a series of association experiments. In criticism of Reclin's observations, it must, however, be stated that 1. Perseveration of the grammatical form is not necessarily an epileptic symptom. Verlin has shown enormous perseveration of the form in imbeciles and idiots. Chapter 3. 2. Perseveration of the content occurs also in normals, as I have shown in my joint work with Reclin. Chapter 2. Ego relationships and personal constellations also occur among normals and feeble-minded, as does likewise the emotional accentuation of the content of the reaction. Poverty of the imagination is obviously not characteristic of epilepsy, but of the feeble-minded as a whole, as it is also, in a certain sense, for emotional stupidity, where it acquires the peculiar form of blank association. In epilepsy, therefore, we have rather to do with a greater or lesser degree of the symptoms which have something of a specific character. My endeavor has been to clarify these conditions and to attempt to separate what is specific in epileptic associations from the different types of normal persons and from congenital feeble-mindedness. Work of this kind must obviously rest upon a large material. The Swiss Asylum for Epileptics in Zurich, with its large number of patients, afforded me an exceptionally favorable opportunity. The greater part of the material was collected by the superintendent of the asylum, Dr. Ulrich. A small part was obtained in the berg Holsley Asylum for the Insane. The total number of persons examined was 158. The total number of associations, 18,277. This extensive basis permitted, to a certain degree, an estimate of the various possibilities 
in the associations of epileptics. Dr. Ulrich and myself therefore undertook a methodical working up of this field, which covers so much that it is of great interest, in order to apprehend the essence of the alterations of associations in epileptics as closely as possible. I proposed the following division of the material. First of all, I separated those cases who were not born feeble-minded, and who were attacked by epilepsy only after the completion of their development, or at least after puberty. I was thus able to reject, from among the epileptics, those extremely numerous cases where congenital feeble-mindedness complicates the picture of the disease. As Verlin's work shows, the imbeciles, insofar as they are to any extent distinctly feeble-minded, appear to have a fairly characteristic type of association marked chiefly by the tendency to definition of the stimulus word. The first investigation of epileptics showed us association types which had, at first sight, great similarity with the imbecile type. The similarity was still greater in the case of epileptics congenitally imbecile or with marked deterioration in early youth. This separation was thus absolutely essential for the recognition of what is specifically epileptic. For external reasons, a further division of the work was made. In the first instance, I analyzed the reactions of a typical case as exhaustively as possible, whilst Dr. Ulrich investigated the different possibilities of the epileptic reaction types. Footnote 1. Dr. Ulrich's work is not included in this volume. And footnote 1. Before beginning the report on the observations, I must make a few remarks on the technique of the procedure. The preparation of the patient for the experiment is an absolutely necessary step. It must be remembered that these persons have, as a rule, no notion of what the experiment demands from them. They thus become easily confused, and this, when at all pronounced, affects the result most distinctly, as I have repeatedly seen. Therefore, we provide some kind of instruction before the experiment. The patient is told that some word will be called out to which he is to answer as quickly as possible, without thinking at all about it with the very first word, or the very first idea that occurs to him. Some examples are then given, the experimenter giving a pretty complete selection of the different associations. The subject is thus placed in a position freely to select the mode of reaction proper to him. If he is not prejudiced, he will naturally choose the mode which is characteristic for him. We take care that the subject is not cramped by restricting himself to a reaction with a single word. Should this be the case, the characteristic mode of reaction is quite effaced, and the reaction time considerably affected. With women, it is not infrequently necessary to subdue impending emotion by a rather simple explanation. I usually do this by representing the experiment as a kind of game of thoughts. A fresh list of stimulus words was used in these experiments. It was composed of 200 different words, of which 75 were concrete, 25 abstract, 50 adjectives, and 50 verbs. The serial order is noun adjective, noun verb. The intermixture was as complete as possible, so that related words did not follow one another. No notice was taken of the number of syllables. The stimulus words were taken from quite different spheres of daily life, practically avoiding all rare words. A series of emotionally toned concepts, such as love, kiss, luck, friendly, etc., were purposely interspersed for a peculiar significance attaches to such words. I select the following case from our material. M. Joseph, machine locksmith, born 1863, a widower, childless, has been convicted 19 times, alleged to have no familial predisposition, good at school, served a three years apprenticeship to a locksmith, good testimonials as to work, no illness of moment in his youth, no signs of epilepsy, was married in 1888. His wife became insane in 1893 and died in an asylum. Since his wife's illness, the patient, till then settled and industrious, began a restless life, traveling nearly all over Europe. He soon ran away from any settled work, took to drink, traveling without any plan, and wandering about in the forests. In this period, he was often in the hands of the police, mostly for theft, Patient states that he has amnesia for the greater part of this period. During 1893-94, he was three times in an asylum for severe mania transitoria. In 1896, patient fractured his skull. In 1896-98, he was again 
in various asylums with delirium. In 1898, tremors were observed confined to one side, occurring in paroxysms. At this time, there was noticed a rather connected delirium with plastic and very stable visions, which were described by the patient with much emotion. At the end of 1904, the patient wandered about aimlessly and half-starved in the mountains. Then he wound up a drinking bout by stealing a bicycle. After this, he again wandered about aimlessly and was caught by the police. Placed in this asylum for observation, the following report was made. Feeble-minded, with epileptic character. There are frequent brief seizures of momentary unconsciousness with aura. Sees dark points, five to six, in a row, which are always going up and down. Feels as if his head were pressed in or fastened together by screws. His chest feels as if drops of water were trickling down. There is a buzzing in the ears. Then anxiety and dread gets hold of him as if he had done something wrong. Or he feels pains in his back which mount up to his head. He has the feeling as if he must tear everything. Or he feels as if a locomotive were suddenly rushing towards him. He becomes dizzy after this aura. Everything turns round and he loses consciousness. These lapses of consciousness were also objectively observed during conversation, and especially whilst card playing, very marked intolerance for alcohol. The associations of this case seem to me, in many respects, very typical for epilepsy, although all the characteristic symptoms were not present. Each case has its own peculiarities. For even here, individual differences between the reaction types play a great part. 1. Coal. Pit coal. 7.2 seconds. 2. Moderate. Not eat much. 12 seconds. 3. Song. Sing. To sing a song. 6.2 seconds. 4. Suppose. I suppose. What do I suppose? Many things. 23.2 seconds. 5. Pain. Because I am ill. 4.2 seconds. 6. Dirty. When an apple is dirty, a plant, everything can be dirty. 5.8 seconds. 7. Moon. That is the moon in the sky. The moon is there. 3. 4 seconds. 8. Laugh. People laugh. 4.2 seconds. 9. Coffee. People drink it. People drink it every day. 4 seconds. 10. Wide. That is the width of a distance. With explanatory gesture. 6.2 seconds. 11. Air. That is the air. The air of nature. Healthy or unhealthy. Good air is good air. 2.2 seconds. 12. Carry. I carry something. A burden or good clothes. 5 seconds. These first 12 reactions allow us to draw certain conclusions. The most striking thing is that the patient does not react merely by one single word, but generally by a whole sentence. A certain significance attaches to this fact. In my experience, based upon an investigation of over 30,000 normal associations, normal persons prefer, as a rule, the reactions in one word, NB, after preliminary instruction as described. There are exceptions where educated persons favor the sentence form. Reeklin and myself quoted an instance of this in our work on the associations of normals. This particular person belonged to the complex constellation type, that is, to the reaction type whose associations at the time of the experiment were under the influence of a presentation complex marked by emotion. Footnote 1. See page 140. End footnote 1. In cases of that kind, we recognize at once the peculiar constellation by the content of the associations. Among normals, there is another type who prefers to express his reactions not exactly in the sentence form, but in two or more words. The predicate type. Footnote 1. See page 142. And footnote 1. Persons of this type form judgments upon and evaluate the object designated by the stimulus word. This naturally takes the form of a predicate, which sufficiently explains the use of several words. In any case, these two types cannot be mistaken for the reactions with which we are now concerned. The sentence form is, however, so frequent and widespread in the pathological sphere, that it becomes difficult to regard it as pathognomonic. An observation worth mentioning, which I cannot, however, support by figures, is that uneducated mental patients seem to have a greater tendency to the sentence form than educated ones. 
Should this observation be confirmed, it could easily be brought into harmony with the fact that the uneducated attach much greater importance to the stimulus word than the educated, a fact repeatedly brought out in the previous chapters. Extremely uneducated persons, whose aim is to give the most appropriate answer and to explain the stimulus word as well as possible, require for this purpose many more words than the educated, who frequently just string the words together verbally. This tendency is seen most distinctly in idiots and imbeciles, where sentences are very frequently constructed. Footnote 2. In Bloehler's view, another fact favors the occurrence of the sentence form in the feeble-minded. The feeble-minded not only grasp with great difficulty a word apart from its context in a sentence, but can hardly think of words apart from the context. End footnote 2. It would be difficult to understand the preference for the sentence form without some such special supposition. This preference entitles us to believe with great probability that there is some abnormality. Before investigating the content of the reactions, we must pay some attention to the reaction times. These are abnormally long. The average reaction time of the uneducated is two seconds. No conclusions can for the moment be drawn from this, for there is no form of disease in which the reaction times may not be prolonged. As Schaffenberg has found the reaction times somewhat prolonged in maniacal excitement, it is not advisable to investigate the reaction times and association experiments for themselves apart from the analysis of the content of the association, for they are absolutely dependent upon the momentary content of consciousness. Now consider the quality of the associations. It is at once apparent that the patient gives himself up to the meaning of the stimulus word. With a pronounced tendency to elucidate and characterize the thing designated by the stimulus word, Verlin has regarded this tendency as peculiarly characteristic of congenital feeble-mindedness. Our case is certainly not one of congenital feeble-mindedness. Perhaps this tendency to explanation arises in every high-grade feeble-minded person. Perhaps it should be assumed that the demented approximates to the congenital imbecile in certain points even if the causes of the two conditions are quite different. In our case, the tendency towards explanation is so distinct that we can readily confirm the forms found in Verlin's work on imbeciles. As tautological elucidation, consider, for instance, suppose, I suppose, etc. Carry, I carry something, etc. Air, that is the air, etc. As explanation by example, we have moderate, not eat much, Dirty, when an apple is dirty, etc. Wide, that is the width of a distance, with explanatory gesture. As statement of the principal quality or activity, we have laugh, people laugh, coffee, people drink it. In this respect, we can demonstrate obvious agreement with the imbecile tendency to explanation. It can't even be said that the patient endeavors not to be misunderstood in this respect. For instance, when there might be some possible doubt as to whether there is a superficial current verbal connection as song, sing, coffee, people drink, he adds something so as to confirm and complete the explanation. Song, sing, to sing a song, coffee, people drink, people drink it every day, similarly 4, 11, 12. These instances show that the patient seems to need to emphasize this tendency to explanation. Besides this tendency, Three of the twelve reactions exhibit the word I. Reactions of this kind are egocentric. Egocentric reactions occur also in normals, where they are found in persons with the egocentric attitude. Footnote 1. See page 138. End footnote 1. This adjustment can be found in three different forms. 1. The subject uses a series of personal reminiscences in his reactions. 2. The subject is under the influence of an emotionally toned presentation complex. He refers nearly every stimulus word to himself, i.e. to the complex, and responds to it as if it were a question touching the complex. 3. The subject belongs to the predicate type and evaluates the thing denoted by the stimulus word from the personal standpoint. In these three types, the ego comes occasionally to the front. Besides this, egocentric reactions occur, on the average, more frequently in the educated than in the uneducated, and most frequently when the subject is unembarrassed. We found that the average figures of egocentric reactions 
to be 1.7% in uneducated men, only 0.5% in uneducated women. This makes the marked occurrence of egocentricity all the more striking in this case. One might think the chief cause of it to be feeble-mindedness. Imbeciles use personal reminiscences relatively often, for their limited horizon provides no others. Verlin has given some beautiful instances of this. Subsequent figures from our material on imbeciles have shown that the figures for egocentric reactions vary between 0 and 2.4%. Among 15 imbeciles, there were in all only 9 who exhibited egocentric reactions. But it should be stated that in Verlin's material, there was an imbecile who exhibited no less than 26.5% egocentric reactions. That is quite an exception and has its own special basis. This imbecile is differentiated from the others by having no true tendency to explanation, but by forming, whenever possible, a school sentence to each stimulus word, which so frequently begins with I, fall, I fall down, run, I run quickly, sick, I get sick with bad fish, advice, I ask my father for advice, head, I have a head, wages, I have earned the wages. These examples show as Verlian points out, that this imbecile endeavors above everything to form school sentences using I, where other imbeciles would say we or people. The term egocentric should be, therefore, only used with caution for these reactions. This case is, as we have said, an exception, and does not alter the fact that imbeciles do as a rule avoid the reference to self. Egocentric reactions do not force themselves on the imbecile, who prefers, on the contrary, such expressions as one, a person, people, etc., in order to get round the I form. Hysteria also, with its innumerable references to the ego, prefers the use of the less incriminating one. Our case, with its pronounced tendency to explanation, exhibits the occurrence of egocentric reactions in a way not found among imbeciles with the same kind of tendency to explanation. It may be objected that the reaction to carry I carry something, etc., is a school sentence. This objection cannot, however, be made to reaction 5, pain, because I am ill. If this egocentric factor tells somewhat against imbecility, still more does the peculiar method of explanation adopted by the patient. I have already drawn attention to the fact that the patient, to a certain extent, accentuates his tendency to explanation by repeating his reaction by way of confirmation or by the addition of an attribute. But he goes still further. He does not content himself with a simple reaction, but can obviously not go far enough to satisfy this need for the full completion of his explanation. In reaction 4, suppose, I suppose, what do I suppose, many things. One sees by the form how he endeavors to add something characteristic. He passes into a really abnormal exuberance in reaction 11. Air, that is the air, the air of nature, healthy or unhealthy, good air is good air. The impulse towards completeness becomes a pleonasm in reaction 10. Wide, that is the width of a distance, with explanatory gesture. Compare also reactions 6, 7, 12. In reactions 11, good air, and 12, good clothes. The predicates seem to express some quite special emphasis. The effort with which he reacts has something altogether inadequate, for this display of concepts exceeds, for the most part, anything that was really necessary to cover the stimulus word. This behavior at once gives the impression of an unnecessary and exaggerated exuberance. It is this factor which is absent in the imbecile, who contents himself with a fairly short reaction, one which appears to him more or less appropriate, but one which is frequently limited to the most primitive hints and to the most unfinished ideas. Our patient, on the contrary, has a strong tendency to heap up as much as possible and to exhaust the reaction, occasionally giving far beyond what is necessary. The twelve reactions hitherto referred to give us grounds for the supposition of intellectual feeble-mindedness, specifically tinged by a marked egocentric factor and by exaggerated exuberance. End of section 26